Welcome to today's course, Introduction to Microsoft Dynamics GP 2013. My name is Kevin Shimke, and I'm a project manager on the Lex Business Productivity Team. My team manages learning projects for Microsoft products. Specifically, my smaller team focuses on Dynamics products, and we focus on Dynamics AX, Dynamics NAV, Dynamics GP, Dynamics CRM, and Dynamics SL. My background includes uh, many years of Microsoft Dynamics GP experience. I'm located in Fargo, North Dakota, and I used to be a certified trainer on the Microsoft Dynamics GP product, focusing on the financial series courses, and I also taught report writer courses along with inventory courses. I have 17 plus years of experience on the training team at Microsoft. Today, our Introduction to Microsoft Dynamics GP 2013 course will have two modules. And the first module will be Microsoft Dynamics GP Overview. And our second module will be the basic elements that you use with, throughout the Microsoft Dynamics GP prod, product. Our target audience is potential new customers who are interested in GP 2013 as a possible solution for their business. We also are targeting new customers who have not started or just started using the Dynamics GP product and want to familiarize themselves with key standard system-wide functionality. Some suggested prerequisites that may help with this course are some general accounting and finance knowledge and also some basic computer and Windows skills. So let's get started with Module 1, Microsoft Dynamics GP Overview. The topics that we'll discuss in this lesson are what is Microsoft Dynamics GP, and we'll discuss potential customers and product insights. For more than 25 years, Microsoft Dynamics GP has delivered comprehensive, out-of-the-box business management functionality from financials and human resource management to manufacturing and operations to power diverse, small, and mid-sized companies around the world. A unique combination of integrated manage business intelligence, collaboration, and communication tools connects the many moving parts of your organization, providing visibility into and control over your business. It is designed to empower people to be more productive and your systems to last longer, and provide you with the ability to scale to accommodate growth while delivering the insight you need to respond quickly in the ever-changing world of business. You will often hear people refer to Microsoft Dynamics GP as an ERP product, an enterprise resource planning product. It is used by a wide range of customers, and its features address numerous needs that a business may have. For example, it offers financial management capabilities. You can automate your payables and receivables management and better manage your business cash flow. As your business expands, the application will allow you to work with multiple currencies, locations, and companies. Manufacturing features include the ability to track production costs, improve controls, and enhance quality assurance. Supply chain management features let you streamline purchasing and sales order processing and improve inventory management. Business intelligence and reporting capabilities include 225 built-in customizable and refreshable Excel reports. IT management options include built-in personalization and customization tools. You can also connect mobile and remote workers. For example, one of the big focuses of the current version of the product, GP2013, was a web client, which allows people to access the application from their device using a web browser whether they are running on-premises or in the cloud. Service and project management features allow you to better manage the cost of providing field service and capture, review, and approve project time and expense data. Risk management features provide you with the option to set and manage security restrictions on data fields, windows, and forms. And finally, human resource management lets you manage your payroll in-house or share data with leading payroll providers. It can also be used to track and implement benefits programs. So let's go to the modules and functionality lesson next. 
Within Microsoft Dynamics GP, we have a number of what we would call series. And the series we have that are typically the most key or most important areas within GP, financial series, which includes uh, modules like general ledger and bank reconciliation. We have the sales series, which is receivables management and sales order processing. And the purchasing series, which is payables management and purchase order processing. Let's talk a little bit about the financial series first and general ledger. So General Ledger is basically the final collecting point within Microsoft Dynamics GP, and it collects transactions from all the other modules if you're using them. So for example, if you enter a transaction in Payables Management, it flows down to General Ledger, and it affects accounts. And your accounts can be like your sales account, your cash account, those types of things. Let's take a look at General Ledger within the GP product. So if you'll notice here, I've, I've opened up the GP product and I'm kind of on the main area of, of the Microsoft Dynamics GP product. And uh, we've got a financials uh, section here. I've used the navigation pane over here. We'll talk a little bit more about the main windows in a little while, but the financial area here is where most of the general ledger windows are located. And we have numerous things that you can do. We have transactional areas, so you can enter transactions directly to affect accounts in general ledger. So a transaction that would be entered in General Ledger might hit you know, a number of accounts for debits, a number of accounts for credits. Then we also have an area where we have financial uh, cards areas. And the financial card is typically where we would store master records uh, within the application. Within General Ledger, the master record is what we would call the accounts. And the accounts would be, like we talked about, sales accounts, it could be revenue accounts, it could be expense accounts, it could be asset accounts, etc., liabilities. The area within GP, though, with accounts, you can have just accounts like that, but you could also track other accounts, such as unit accounts, which might track, for example, the amount of square footage that you have or the number of employees that you have. Additionally, you can see down on the screen here, we have some variable allocation and fixed allocation accounts. And these accounts can be used to basically manage processes where you might allocate an expense based on maybe the number of employees that each particular department has, for example. We also have numerous uh, areas where you can keep track of history, uh, budgeting information, and some other things here within the cards area. You'll also notice within the reports area, we have numerous reports within the general ledger area, and most of these reports are geared off of information about accounts. Within the area, you can see we have financial statements, so things like your balance sheet, uh, your profit and loss statement, etc., can be printed from here. And we have some other things like a trial balance report, which is probably pretty critical in most businesses. And then some reports like on budgets and things that are probably more optional uh, in, in some businesses. We also have inquiry windows. And typically, inquiry windows are very helpful when you want to take a look at what's happening in your business. Inquiries can let you see transactional information. And oftentimes, especially if you're from other modules, you can drill back and see um, original transactions, so a debit and a credit that ends up in General Ledger could end up being created by a transaction that maybe was a sale in sales order processing, for example. We also have numerous routines, and if you look here, the routines, we have things like a year-end closing, a reconcile process, so these are usually more utility type of items. And we also have some utilities like removing history, reconciles, etc. So that's a little bit about General Ledger. Next, let's talk a little bit about Bank Reconciliation, which is one of the other key financial series modules. Within Bank Reconciliation, we have a, a key master record, which would be our checkbook. And the checkbook is kind of the, the account uh, that General Ledger would have, the key record. Uh, you can have multiple checkbooks. They could be in multiple banks. You could have multiple checking accounts at the same bank. You um, can track all that within the the checkbook maintenance window setting each one up as a checkbook. And you can also enter transactions within uh, bank reconciliation like deposits that you have, uh, miscellaneous types of transactions, maybe adjustments, uh, service charges, etc., and even bank transfers. And there's also a uh, reconcile bank statement option here which allows you to reconcile each month.
There's also reports within the uh, area here. We've got uh, reports like bank posting journals, bank history, etc. So numerous uh, different reports that you can print to get more information about that. We also have bank inquiry windows, which allow you to view the information that you would look at on reports uh, right directly on your screen. And you could go and drill back into transactional information related to a checkbook, which could even take you back into your other modules like payables or sales order processing, etc. There are also some uh, utilities and routine type screens that you could go ahead and access. You notice here in the utilities, we've got a remove bank history option. We've also got um, some other options uh, within the, uh, the areas here that would relate to bank reconciliation. So that's the financial series, uh, general ledger and bank reconciliation. Let's talk next about the sales series modules, uh, which would be receivables management and sales order processing. We'll go back into the application and just take a quick look at some of the windows that we see in receivables and sales order processing. You'll notice underneath the cards area, we have numerous cards within the sales area, and the, the most or key one would be the customer uh, records. Uh, customer records are, again, the master records within receivables, and they can track information about what customers you have, uh, what their um, service charges should be, what transactions have occurred during the month, etc. So the customer record tracks all that information, including the customer balance. And we have some other things like national accounts and even prospects if you have uh, necessity in your business to track those. We also even have a place where you can track salespeople that you have in sales territories if your business is quite large uh, within the, the cards area there. Within transactions, you'll notice that there's numerous transactional entry windows here, uh, but a little bit tricky because most of the ones that you see up here at the top are really for sales order processing. The receivables windows are more down here at the bottom of the transactional uh, areas, like transaction entry, uh, cash receipts entry, where you can enter transactions directly into receivables. And receivables transactions will automatically flow then onto the general ledger, debits and credits, to the accounts in question. We also have numerous reports, and you can see that there are quite a few reports within the receivables man, uh, management module, like a trial balance, where you could go ahead and print a report which lists all your customers and what they owe you, and you can print that in a detailed form where you could see individual transactions or more like a summary form where you would just see uh, customer balances. We also have the familiar inquiry screens that we saw both in General Ledger and Payables. And so you can do uh, inquiries on accounts, uh, documents, customer accounts, you know, by transaction, by, by document, and even do some type of summary inquiries where you look at yearly totals or even like a total overall receivables. And then we have some routines also, uh, things like schedule payments. Uh, some businesses might need to use schedule payments and an example of one of those might be a car dealership. Uh, most people don't have the money to put down $10,000 or $20,000 on a car immediately. And so you, they might end up having scheduled payments for maybe a period of two, three, maybe even up to five years. And the scheduled payments window allows you to do those types of transactions within the receivables management module where you have repetitive payments over a period of time. We also have numerous utilities windows within the receivables module, like a reconcile, um, that can help you um, manage the receivables transactional information, and you can also remove history that accumulates over time. The sales order processing module is also part of the sales uh, area here, and the sales pro order processing module basically feeds into the receivables management module. Uh, within receivables management, you have your customers. Sales order processing, you don't have customers, but you enter transactions and you use or share the customer uh, file with receivables. So if you have things like maybe a standard order uh, that a customer would have or you have a, a, a sales order where you're going to go and fill it in a warehouse type of situation, you might need to do sales order versus receivables. Sales order also lets you do uh, printing of invoices and do some more things like ordering inventory items, back ordering items. So lots more functionality within the sales order processing man module uh, that you don't get within receivables. Receivables is more of, of a lightweight type of module where sales order allows you to do more of the, the management types of processes, especially dealing with inventory. 
Um, you can see some of the same types of windows that you saw earlier. We saw the transactional entry windows. You have those up here at the top of the window in transaction entry, like sales transaction entry, where you can enter all kinds of different transactions. You can see here where we have order fulfillment. We have the print sales documents, which is where you can print uh, things like your invoice, etc. And uh, we also even have some uh, invoicing windows here as part of uh, the invoicing module, which is also another module, part of the sales uh, series of modules that allows you to do light invoicing, a little bit more so than the receivables module, but you can't do any inventory transactional information like you can do with these uh, sales order processing uh, windows up at the top. Uh, we also have some reports, similar types of reports. All these reports uh, pull from both sales order processing and receivables. Um, so you can see uh, information about transactions that have occurred uh, by your customers. And we also have some inquiry windows uh, down at the bottom that allow you to view sales order specific transactions versus things that came from receivables. So that's the sales uh, series of modules or the key sales series modules. Next, let's go ahead and talk about the purchasing series modules. And the purchasing series modules uh, basically um, are two modules. We have both the accounts payable or payables management module, and we also have the purchase order processing uh, module. And like on the sales side, we have master records within uh, the payables management module, and that would be your vendors. And uh, vendors can be entered, and you can track which vendors you do business with, and you can go ahead and put in transactions where you purchase something from the vendor and then you might pay them using a check run. Uh, we also have numerous uh, purchase, uh, purchasing transaction windows. And if you take a look at the, the purchasing transaction windows, pretty similar to what we saw with the sales uh, order processing receivable side, we have windows that you can use for purchase order processing for transactions, which would be a purchase order where you might receive the items and then you also get billed or invoiced for the items. But we also have just uh, normal payables transactions uh, that you can enter where you just say, hey, I owe this vendor $500 and you might not need to do a purchase order. So both, uh, both types of things can be done, it's just different windows that you would use it in. You can see here we also have numerous windows that relate to paying a vendor. Uh, that's a little bit unique compared to the sales side of things. We have things like um, the edit checks window, the print checks, post checks. So you can go ahead and print a group of vendors all at one time. You could go ahead and do in individual payments for each individual vendor if you needed to uh, within the window here. And we have some of the same types of things. We have some reports for payables management like a trial balance report where you can see what vendors you owe money to and you could print that in a detail or summary form again where you could see individual transactions or just simply a lump sum amount that you owe uh, to each vendor. We also have some inquiry windows and like we had on the sales side we have transactions by vendor, we can do it by document so we can also do a summarize uh, by payables and also for the purchase order processing uh, we have some purchase order uh, specific inquiry windows on documents and items that you have. Finally, at the end, we have some routines. And the, within the routines area here, you'll notice one of the key things that we have is the ability to print 1099 forms. So if you're within the United States, uh, the payables management module will, will let you go ahead and generate those 1099 forms at the end of the year so that you can get those out to your vendors. So it does address that need that a lot of businesses, especially in the United States, have. We also have some utilities. We can do a num numerous things like a reconcile. You can see that you can remove some history um, both in both payables management and in purchase order processing here. You can see we have a removed purchasing history for that. We have transaction history which is within the payables management module. So that's the purchasing series. And we talked about some other key functionality um, that we have, and we have a number of things on here that we'll just uh, lightly touch on. The first one is inventory, and inventory is a module that allows you to go ahead and track items within your business. So if you're a, a business where you're selling something, maybe it's a retail environment or even maybe a wholesale environment, uh, the retail items, you can put in items in your inventory. You can track quantities. 
So if you have you know, 50 widgets or 30 chairs or whatever you have within your business, you can track those within the inventory module. And if you use purchase order processing or sales order processing, transactions that you enter in those modules, say it's a purchase order that you enter there, uh, when you receive the quantities from the vendor that you purchased them for, they can automatically be updated into the inventory module. And likewise with sales, if you sell something, it can take away quantities. So it allows you to manage inventory items and information related to those. We also have fixed assets, and fixed assets is a module that basically lets you manage uh, any types of assets in your business. So maybe your uh, chairs, your furniture, those types of things all can be managed, and you can track information about that. Uh, the key feature allows you to depreciate those assets and transfer that information onto the general ledger. We also have a pay, payroll and human resources solution, and both of those modules do probably what you would expect. Uh, payroll lets you process payroll checks for your employees, lets you track things like benefits that you might have uh, with uh, things on, on a person's check, like a 401k plan. Those types of things all can be tracked within the payroll module. And human resources lets you go a step further and track unique things, maybe like injuries that you have, especially if you have unions, you might have things that you have to track related to that. So human resources gives you even more information about employees and able to track some additional things that are more related to the human resource side of things rather than paying the employee. We also have a multi-currency module, and the multi-currency module allows you to have information transferred to, to basically one set of chart of accounts, even if you have multiple currencies. For example, maybe you have a store in the United States, deals with US dollars, and another one in, say, uh, somewhere in Japan, and you have the yen. So the information can be basically done in yen in the Japanese office and transferred into a, a, an account within the general ledger and converted into dollars in the U.S. if that's what you have to report in. There are also numerous tools within uh, Microsoft Dynamics GP, and some of those uh, more common or popular tools that people use, Report Writer, which allows you to go ahead and modify reports. There are other uh, solutions for reports, and we'll talk about some of that a little bit later on. But there's numerous ways that you can go ahead and access information. One of those ways, of course, being with Report Writer. You can modify, uh, decide to add, subtract fields, move fields around, etc. There's also a tool called the modifier, which allows you to modify screens. So if there's certain fields that you don't use within your business, you can take those fields off. You can add fields that you want to use. So uh, numerous tools, and we'll just touch on some of those uh, a little bit later on in, in the course. So that's a little bit about some of the modules within uh, Microsoft Dynamics GP. Next, let's talk a little bit about the integration uh, that occurs within the product. And we have two types of integration, really. Uh, one type of integration that we have is that we integrate with other Microsoft products. So, for example, we use Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel. We have what we call Word templates, where you can go ahead and use them for reports. We in in integrate with Excel, and again, we have Excel reports. And uh, there is a course that's called the Business Intelligence course out here on on the Microsoft Virtual Academy that if you're interested in some of those options, you could go ahead and watch that. But those areas uh, integrate with those products and we even have some communications links with Microsoft Link. So for example, if you put in information about a customer or a vendor that you can communicate directly through Microsoft Link with that information that's provided within the master records. There's also integration that occurs between modules within the Microsoft uh, Dynamics uh, GP product. And if you take a look at the, uh, the image here that we, sh we are showing on the screen, um, here are some of the key modules. And you can see at the top there we have most of the inventory series modules. We have the sales order processing and purchase order processing modules. And you can see arrows of where information flows. So you can see information flows throughout the system. So let's take just a quick little bit of time here and talk about some of the integration that occurs within each of these key modules. There's certainly other modules that you might use, like manufacturing, like field service, but we'll focus on some of the key modules that most everybody uses. Uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about purchase order processing. 
Uh, purchase order processing uh, integrates mainly with the payables management module. That's the key module that it would integrate with. So when you go ahead and want to enter a purchase order, it shares the vendor file like we talked about earlier. So you can go ahead and pull up a vendor and then you can enter information about uh, what you're purchasing. Now that could be possibly inventory items. And so we do in integrate with inventory um, automatically. So when you have a transaction where you receive items within purchase order, it can increase the quantity of that item within inventory. But you could also, have, for example, purchase a fixed asset, and so you could go ahead and directly go to fixed assets with that item. Or it could possibly be that you're just doing non-inventory items. So the transaction flow would just be to general ledger um, after the, the payables management uh, integration occurs directly um, to GL with a debit and credit to accounts. We also have the inventory module, and we've talked a little bit about that in conjunction with both purchase order processing and sales order processing. Um, it basically is there to manage your inventory items and inventory quantities. Now, you could enter transactions that directly affect uh, the general ledger, and you can see that we do have a, a transactional arrow here to general ledger. That's probably pretty uncommon in most businesses because most of the transactions are probably going to be flowing through either purchase order processing or sales order processing. If you buy something, you're of course entering that as a purchase order from a vendor and it's going to go ahead and update and increase your quantities of, of the item in inventory. If you sell it to a customer, you're going to go ahead and enter that into sales order processing and it flows through the system. It will decrease the quantities directly in inventory. However, there could be a case, for example, where you need to just make an adjustment into inventory. One example I can think of, I used to work in a retail store and you have what we would call shrinkage, right, or theft. And so you could have situations where, you know, you thought you had 30 according to the count in, in the application. It says you have 30 chairs, but one chair is missing. And so you need to make that adjustment. And by doing the transaction in inventory, you can send that on to General Ledger, adjust the accounts that are necessary and the quantities without affecting a sale or a purchase, since that didn't occur with that particular item. Sales order processing, we've talked about, and that's where you enter in orders from your customers. And the benefits, of course, is that you can do invoices. And like we talked about, it will uh, increase, or I should say decrease, the quantities of of the uh, items in inventory that you sell. The information as far as what the customer owes flows into receivables management there. So you can see that the arrow flows down to receivables management so it can update the customer's account. There is one other place that transactional flow could occur and that's to bank reconciliation. If you're using that and you're tracking uh, information about your banking, banking accounts, your checking account or maybe a savings account, information could flow in that relates to cash. Whether you receive cash from the customer, um, most of that information is probably going to occur in receivables management, but some of that could be recorded in sales order processing also. Since we're on that side, we'll just go ahead and move down here to receivables management. And like we talked about, receivables management tracks your customer information. And you could enter transactions directly in receivables management uh, that wouldn't require you to invoice something. Uh, an example of that might be, let's say your uh, business is, you know, you do haircuts or, you know, any type of related items that, that are related to a haircut, maybe a shampoo, etc. Well, you probably don't need to invoice the customer because the, the customer doesn't really want or need an invoice uh, when they... Uh, get the service from you to get their haircut. So that type of transaction could be entered directly in receivables management and that would flow down to general ledger. So you wouldn't have to use sales order processing, which is a little bit more complicated and usually involves some type of sale of an item, an inventory item, where you want more uh, flexibility. Uh, information from receivables management will also flow into bank reconciliation. So when you go ahead and get money from your customer, if they pay you by check, or if they pay you by cash, that information can go ahead and update the bank reconciliation module. And we'll just move to the bank reconciliation module next. And we've talked a little bit about how bank reconciliation is a place where you have your checking accounts. It collects all the cash, um, you know, checks, et cetera, anything to do with money that would affect the account in one place. And it could come from, you know, numerous modules. We talked about sales order. Um, receivables, management, etc. You can also enter transactions directly into bank reconciliation. So if it's a transaction like we talked about, a service charge from the bank, there's probably not anything related to a customer in that regard, but you could enter that transaction 
directly in bank reconciliation and still update the cash account uh, within the general ledger. You can also see that Payables Management integrates with Bank Reconciliation, and that's because within Payables Management, of course, you could be paying your vendors by check, and those checks would flow right into Bank Reconciliation. Within Payables Management, similar type of thing that we had in Receivables Management on the other side, uh, we do collect transactions from purchase orders, so when you order items, uh, from a vendor and you eventually receive those in invoice, the invoicing portion, which is of course the amount you owe flows down into payables management. Uh, we could also buy uh, an asset directly within payables management. So if we're being billed by a vendor for a particular asset that we're purchasing, it could go ahead and update uh, fixed assets for us. And of course eventually at some point when we enter the transaction payables uh, information can flow down to general ledger. And when we're talking about transactional integration, uh, the key process typically that causes the information to flow from one module to another is called posting uh, within the Microsoft Dynamics GP product. So when you post a transaction from Payables Management, it goes ahead and flows down and updates uh, the general ledger, either in, in, as a batch or a group of transactions where then you can post it and affect the general ledger, or you can set it up so that the system has you posted in Payables and it just updates all the way through. So those are some of the types of system type questions that you'll answer that will determine how uh, the process occurs of, of integration. Now we did talk a little bit about some situations that do not uh, have a transaction associated with it, and I'll use the example purchase order processing. If you receive items uh, from a vendor, let's say you get um, you know, a, a particular item that you're selling and the vendor has shipped it to you, you received the uh, item with a transactional process and purchase order, the information in inventory is automatically updated there. There's no transaction that goes to increase the transactional amount of the item within the inventory module. The transaction flow that occurs is actually down through payables management typically like we talked about or possibly into like fixed assets if you bought an asset. But the automatic update occurs into inventory if you're using purchase order. Uh, with the quantity increase, and then of course on the other side, sales order processing would allow you to decrease the inventory when you sell the item. So those uh, cases, it's really not transactional flow, it's just simply updating those modules. So that's a little bit about integration, and so let's next go to the next lesson here and talk a little bit about user preferences. And user preferences is kind of an area that allows you to go ahead and set options and how things will look for a particular user. And each user can go ahead and set user preferences and not really affect anybody else. So it's kind of nice I can have, have it look a certain way and you might not like the way I've chosen to, to view the screen. You can make um, some different choices uh, within the user preferences module. So let's take a look in the application here real quick and talk about user preferences. And there's numerous ways to get to the, to the windows. You can see there's menus up here at the top, and we'll talk about those. And then there's also uh, choices along uh, the area here. Um, I'm gonna go back uh, to the home page here, which is typically the first page that comes up uh, when you start talking about um, Microsoft Dynamics GP launching. You go ahead and log in, and, and you come up to a home page. And you can see user preferences as a choice right here off the home page. And so I'm going to go ahead and open the user preferences window here. And so this is the window where I go ahead and set my options per user that we talked about. And again, these do not affect other people. So whatever I make the choice here, it's only affecting me on my machine, even though I'm using maybe even in the same company, for example, as other users. And so you can see here that a number of things, I've got a choice, horizontal scroll arrows, which is just a viewing thing. I can say, hey, I want normally my reports to go out to a printer. Maybe I don't have a printer in my office, so I just want them to go to the screen. Um, I can use a different entry key. Usually the entry key um, is the tab key that moves you from field to field within the application, but maybe you're used to something else and you want to use the return key for that. So lots of different things. You can see even a default sales document type. So if you're the person in sales order that you always enter the quotes for your company, you could set it to quote, but if you're only doing invoices, you could set it to invoice so that it just defaults to that uh, within that transactional entry window. And there's even some uh, more technical IT type things where you might use uh, distributed processes here. Uh, one of the other things on the window, if you look towards the bottom here, is a mapping option. And within the application, um, 
numerous master records will allow you to do something uh, using MapPoint. Uh, for example, maybe you have a vendor and you put in the vendor's uh, address and you need to drive to that location. Well, one of the things you can do is you can use MapPoint built in uh, application from Microsoft that allows you to see a map and directions uh, can be gotten from that particular source. Um, just because you have it within the application, you don't really have to do anything within MapPoint. You just click a button and we'll see that when we go to some of the master record windows a little bit later. There's also a number of different windows here that you can see that you can set reminders and reminders we won't talk about too much but you could set reminders where a certain situation would happen within the application. You can go ahead and have the system remind you of that. There's also a place where you can go ahead and choose to change your password uh, within the user preferences window. This is not possible however if you're the system administrator. That button may be dimmed out if you're the system administrator um, back home. And then there's an autocomplete, which is basically a way to go ahead and do some entries into a window where if you type the first few letters, the application will go ahead and help you fill out the remaining, um, or at least try to guess what you're, you're going to be typing there. But let's focus on the display button here. So I'm going to click on the display button and move to user display preferences. This particular window allows you to set how things look within the application. So the first window was more uh, specific options like, you know, do you want to use the return key? There are a few display things like horizontal scroll arrows, but this is more display within the application. And if you take a look here um, at the, the top, we have a preview window. And I accidentally closed that, so here we'll bring it back. Sorry about that. But if you take a look there, the preview window kind of gives you an idea of what choices you've made below. And you can see there we've got a font color of blue for link fields and a font style of underline. So if you take a look, link fields within the application, if you click on those, lets you do things like zooming to another place within the application. So kind of nice to be able to tell, um, similar to what you're used to on the web, where you can see that, hey, there's a link there um, where I can go someplace else. And you can even have something for uh, link and required fields. So if the field is required on the window, but it's also a link field, you could have it you know, look a little bit differently. And normal fields can look a certain way and required fields. And you can see in this particular case, I've got the choice of font color black and font style for bold for required fields so that those basically stand out on any window. So I can kind of tell the difference between what fields I would have to fill in versus what fields that I could fill in if I need to or want to. In some cases, uh, the options here that you set within user preferences might require some additional setup. And what I mean by that is, in this particular case, required fields, if you go into the application and you've set it that they're you know, black and bold and they're not looking like that, there is an additional option that you have to set. And I'll show you this one. So let's go ahead and take a look at here back in the application. And there's a show required fields under the help menu um, that you basically have to turn on. And you can see that I've got it turned on right now. But if that isn't checked, even though you've set your options to basically display them differently here in the user uh, preferences, display preferences window, they won't automatically show black and bold unless you turn that show required fields on. So there's sometimes additional setup involved other than just the user uh, display preferences, but not a whole lot. Usually it's just a simple question like you see there. I'll click OK here to close out of the Display Preferences window. So that's basically user preferences, the two areas where you can go ahead and set information that are probably more key than others are the Display Preferences and then the main window. Of course, we showed you that you could set some reminders, change password individually there also, uh, except for the SA user. So let's go to the next lesson. And let's talk a little bit about security. Uh, security within Microsoft Dynamics GP uh, mainly focuses on user security, but there is some other security that we allow or have within the application depending on the amount of security. An example I can think of is you might have a business where you only have one or two people. So maybe you don't need security on individual windows because everybody has access to everything. Uh, we do have some capabilities to address those, but then you might have a large company where you have maybe 5,000 employees where you need security where maybe only certain people can get into the payroll uh, area, for example. Probably pretty critical in most businesses that people can't see what other people are making. 
You can basically lock down by module. Uh, you can even do it by window. Um, that's probably pretty common. And so let's take a look at some of the security options so you can understand basically what security is available uh, to you within Microsoft Dynamics GP. Uh, we talked about uh, small companies. You might just use the system and company security. And the system password is basically just locking down system windows. So key windows that allow you to set up things like a company, um, you know, do some changes that are system-wide types of changes. Uh, it will lock you out of those areas, but not out of any other window, like in financials, for example. You could get into all the general ledger windows, uh, all the payables windows, etc. You could also go ahead and just uh, have a company security. So maybe you have one person that is dealing with a company. Um, another person is in another company, but you don't have a lot of users, and you could certainly set security by user on a per company basis. So I could have access to company A, but not company B within the Great Plains, uh, the GP system. The most common is user security. Like I said, especially if you're a larger company and user security is uh, usually role-based within Microsoft Dynamics GP. And within Microsoft Dynamics GP, we have a couple of things that you go ahead and set up and we'll show you those in just a minute. We have security tasks and we have security roles. So a security role is basically just a collection of tasks. So the task might be, for example, that you know I set up customers, or I set up uh, employees, or I set up accounts. Those could all be tasks that you need to accomplish uh, within the application. So you can go ahead and set up the tasks and grant access to those tasks to a particular role. And once those tasks are assigned to the role, the role can then be assigned to the user. So let's take a look at those windows. So we'll go back into the application here. And we'll go ahead and click on the uh, Administration tab. And you can see here within the setup area, there is some setup that we talked about earlier. Uh, we have uh, some of the windows. We have our system password here. You know, we even have something called feed, field level security, which we didn't talk about too much. But right at the top, if you notice here in the system area, we have security tasks and security roles. So let's just take a quick look at the security tasks window. And um, if you'll notice here, if I hit the lookup window here, I'm just going to look at some of the security tasks. We have lots of different tasks here within uh, the application. You can see some are in the company category, some are in the system category, and so forth. You can see payroll, etc. So each of those tasks you can go ahead and set up uh, that you're going to have a user do. And once those tasks are set up here within the task window, the next thing you go to is the security roles window. And the roles window here is more like a role that you would have in your business. So you can see that we have things like account manager or AP clerk. And basically, once the tasks that that person would typically do in your business are assigned to the role, then these roles can be assigned to the user. So I've got each one of the roles here, and I'm just going to select the account accounting manager here, for example, and you can see all the security tasks that right now that are assigned to the accounting manager here in my lesson company, and I could go ahead and uncheck the box. So if I don't want them to set up taxes, I could, you know, uncheck that, and they would not have access for, the accounting manager would not have access to set up taxes. And I can go ahead and make all those choices all the way through here, and you can see that I've also got a mark all and a non-mark all, and I can display only certain areas which makes it a little bit easier to make those types of selections. And once I do that, I can save the role and then assign it uh, to, to the user. But before I do that, I want to just talk briefly about why it's nice to have security tasks and roles. Because if you set up a security role, once you set up that role, if you have, let's say, five accounting managers or five accounting AP clerks, uh, you don't have to go and set up the security for each individual user. Uh, in the past and in other applications, you might be used to setting up user security where you would go in and say, hey, the user should have access to you know, A, B, and C, not D and E. Well, in this particular case, if you set up a role and you have a particular group of people that are in that role, you set it up once as the role and then just simply assign the role to the user. Now, once you assign the role to the user, you certainly have the option to go back and make changes. So maybe there's one AP clerk that you don't want to have access to a certain window that others would. You can still do that after the assigning occurs to the user because there is access to, to, to security within the user uh, windows also. 
So let's go ahead and close the security role setup window here real quick and I'll just discard the changes. And we'll just pop into the user window here real quick and you can see in the particular uh, area here, you've got a role in the home page role and this is where you could assign the role to the user is right within the user uh, window here within Microsoft Dynamics GP. There are other types of security with other uh, products that we use within Microsoft Dynamics GP. For example, if you get into using Excel reports, for example, uh, there certainly could be other security that you use there. Uh, we use a SQL database. So there could even be SQL um, types of security that access, but the main security within the application is the task roles and then assigned to users, along with the possibility to have some security system-wide using the system password, or possibly per company using the company access uh, options that we have within the application. So that's our first lesson, and our, I should say our first module, and join me in module two when we start talking about some basic elements that we have within the Microsoft Dynamics GP system.